We're uh, talking about the eternal struggle, and tonight, uh, for the first half, it's going to be really easy to follow along the notes, because I had a little problem with my, uh, my PowerPoint not um, uh, saving correctly, so some stuff's missing, and we have to go back and rebuild, it looks like that. Basically, the Babylonians conquered, because of Israel's sin, they conquered Jerusalem. Uh, they carted everybody off in about three different ways. At first, just a few were carted off, and the second one, a whole bunch, almost everybody was carted off for the third time. The last remnants were carted off, and then the ones that were left got hauled against their will down to Egypt. We'll talk about that tonight. So, um, suffice it to say, uh, the, the land of Judea was vacated of Jewish people because of their sin. And God had forewarned against this. He predicted it back all the way back to Moses. He said, if you stop all my law, you stop keeping the law, that's what's going to happen to you. But then he also said, but if that happens to you, or I actually said, when that happens to you, if you turn back to me, I'll bring you back. And so Jeremiah kept telling him it was coming, and no one would believe him. He kept warning him, no one would believe him. It, they, they threw him in a pit, and he still told him they wouldn't believe him. And then it happened. And then after it happens, he tells them, for 70 years, and you're going to come back. And this time, the people who were left, it does. Oh, sweet. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so they're deported to Babylon, 2 Kings 25. At that time of the destruction of Jerusalem, there was a famine and pestilence in the city. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar surrounded it. It came to pass the ninth year of the reign, the tenth month, the tenth day. Uh, ten is always a number of judge, God's judgment, um, which is a little freaky because I was born on the tenth day, the tenth month, the tenth after ten at night. Um, <laughs> he, he, gets, he gets away through a secret passage and off he goes. And many people in Judah died in the famine. Jehokim had been told that his seed could not rule as king. And Zedekiah, his father's brother, had been placed on the throne in his stead. And through Jeremiah the prophet, God says, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants, and the people such as are left in the city, from the pestilence, from the sword, and the famine of the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of his enemies, and the hand of those that seek their life. And he shall smite them with the edge of the sword, and shall not spare them, neither have pity nor mercy. And so, the king comes, uh, the first one is uh, uh, taken off the captivity, then this, his brother is put on the throne, Zedekiah, who's the king of this joke and his curse, he's put on the throne, and then he rebels 11 years later, and then Babylon comes back again, takes the city again, and this time takes all Zedekiah's sons, puts them in front of him, kills them in front of him, and then pokes his eyes out. And then hauls him off into captivity to be a king in captivity uh, for, for the rest of his life. He never comes back. Um, Satan's hopes must have been extremely high at this point, right? Satan knew that he would bring judgment upon Zedekiah, and it was fulfilled to the letter. And the king of Babylon um, uh, slew the sons of Zedekiah right before his eyes. And so I just, I just told you about that. Um, and Zedekiah was taken prisoner and held to his death. Never came back. Him and his mom and those people, they never, they never came back. Uh, God also spoke through the prophet of Ezekiel concerning Zedekiah. My net will spread on him and he shall be taken in my snare and I will bring him to Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it though he shall die there. Okay, so here's the prophecy. He says, he's going to Babylon, but he won't see it. But he'll die there. Well, how is that fulfilled? Uh, the other guys have poked his eyes. And so he never saw it. He went there, he died there, but he never saw it. Just as Ezekiel had promised. The city of Jerusalem uh, were destroyed. Uh, the chief priests and the second priests were slain. The only ones left were the poor in the city. Uh, then a lion was made governor. And Jeremiah, the prophet who foretold the captivity, was one of those left in the land. So Jeremiah had been saying, submit to the Babylonians, don't fight them. They're coming, submit to them, they're from God. And so because of that, the Babylon king of Babylon knew, he left Jer well, Jeremiah, it was helpful. <laughs> and so he left Jeremiah alive. Jeremiah did not. Then Jeremiah went to Gedaliah, the son of Gedaliah, uh, to his top, and dwelt with them among the people that were left in the land. And the Jews who had fled upon hearing that Gedaliah was made governor, Returned from Moab and from Edom and other countries to dwell in. So there's a remnant left, okay? And um, 
Likewise, all the Jews of Moab among the Amorites and the Edomites and the countries the king of Babylon had left a remnant in Judah. And he had set them over, set over them Gedaliah, and, and he was this governor. These men had hopes that Judah would be solid. And uh, that was not the case, uh, as we're going to see. So, um, Gedaliah was the governor, and the people were scattered around the nations. They started returning. However, Ishmael, the person of, of royal seed, ten princes of the king, came to Gedaliah and slew him. So the guy that Nebuchadnezzar left in charge gets assassinated. And he, so where before Satan had been concentrating on the sons of David and the male descendants, now he starts going after the women. Because now he's like, well, one of these women is going to be the one whom this, vir this virgin. And so he starts going after the young daughters of the king. Now he's, now he's trying to, he, he, he's an equal opportunity to kill her. And he carried away the captive, uh, the people that were left, even the king's daughters and all the people that remained in Mizpah. So they all get hauled off. Um, and, and carried away. Well, the next day, Ishmael slew some Jews in the body. He threw their bodies in a pit. He carried away Jews captive, including the king's daughters. He attempted to take them to go to the Amorites. Um, however, Jonathan, who had warned the governor against Ishmael, rescued the captives of Ishmael. Jonathan took the Jews and, and, and started from Bethlehem to go to Egypt. Jeremiah warned him, not, don't go to Egypt. He said, no, if you stay here, in Israel, God will protect you, and Babylon won't hurt you. And even after all the things that Jeremiah predicted, this Jonathan jerk won't listen to Jeremiah. And not only does he not, does he not listen to Jeremiah and force everyone by force, military force, to go to Egypt that's left, he forces Jeremiah to go to. And Jeremiah knew that if they went down there, they were dead. So Jeremiah gets drug captive to his own death. Um, he said, Thus saith the Lord the God of Israel, unto whom you sent uh, me to present your supplication before him. If you will still abide in the land, then I will build you and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you. And if you for I repent of the evil that I have done to you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord. I will save you to deliver you from his hand. I will show mercies to you that you may and that you may have mercy on you and cause you to return to your own land. He's like, just stay here and you'll be saved. But they, they won't listen. <clears throat> so shall it be all the men set their faces to go to Egypt to sojourn there, and they shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. None of them shall remain or escape from the evil. I will bring on. If you go to Egypt, you're going to die of disease, of sickness, of you're going to die. Don't go to Egypt. They wouldn't listen. And they went to Egypt. You know, sometimes God brings his punishment. And instead of trusting God and doing what he says, people in fear go to some human way to save them from what they do. And the devil often uses fear of man to get us to disobey God and not trust God. Well, oh, you know, back in the time of the judges, we need a king like everybody else. <clears throat> How many times is it fear that the devil uses to get people to disobey God? Just do what God says through his messenger, and he'll take care of you. The only thing you have to fear is God. Be afraid of Him. Don't be afraid to do what God says. Never, ever, ever, ever be afraid to do what God commanded you to do. He told you to tell people about it. Don't be afraid to do that. He told you to give generously. Don't be afraid to do that. You know, He, he told you that, uh, that if you seek first the kingdom and its righteousness, all the things will be added to you. Don't be afraid to do that. They won't listen. And off they go to their death. Jonathan and the people would not listen to the warning of God. They even forced Jeremiah and his scribe and Barak to accompany him to Egypt. And there they would all die. Jeremiah made prophecies concerning the Jews while in Egypt. And he reminded them how Judah was now. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. He has seen all the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem and upon its cities, on Judah. Behold this day a desolation. No man dwells therein. It was totally desolated. 
He informed those that had gone to Egypt to escape would die, as he said. Egypt, too, was to fall into the hands of their enemies. However, he gives a word of comfort at the end of his prophecy. Fear thou not, O servant Jacob. Be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thee from afar. Thy seed from the land of captivity. Talk about Babylon. Jacob shall return to be at rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. There was yet hope for the remnant of Judah. The Messiah would yet come from Judah to those who fled in unbelief. So, there's no stopping the Messiah. Now, it looks from outward that the devil is totally won. The promised land is vacated. The ten tribes of the north are either dead or intermarried with pagans and totally abandoned the worship of God. They're no longer God's people. The remnant of Judah and Benjamin and any of the righteous tribes that were left, they've been hauled off to captivity. The ones that were what didn't went to Egypt and died. And there was not, no one left in the land. The walls were down. The city was destroyed. It Imagine what it would have been like in 70 years. Overgrown, trees, brush. It would have been totally decimated by the time they came back. They had to start from scratch. Um, totally destroyed. Because they would not follow God. But even at that desperate moment, when it seemed like Satan had won, the king had been cursed, that none of his sons would sit on the throne, the people were in captivity, the people were mourning. Even at that point, God is saying through Jeremiah, I won't fix it. You're going to turn back to me, and I'm going to restore you. And it doesn't matter how bad it looks in the world, or how bad it looks in the country, or how bad it looks with the persecution. It doesn't matter if it seems like evil's winning. If God's people, that righteous remnant, will just trust him eternally, he's going to fix it. And he's going to bring victory. It was the darkest hour of Christianity in its new fledgling state. Stephen was killed by the Jews. The Christians were persecuted and run out. And yet it wasn't the end of the church. It was the start of its spread. Then James gets beheaded. It looks bad for the church. But the gospel spread. And the guy who held the coats for those who murdered Stephen went on a rampage, arresting people, killing people, breathing out threats. He was destroying the church. It seemed bad. But then he decided to go to Damascus. And Saul became Paul. <clears throat> and you never know how God's going to deliver and what God's going to do. And what good God's going to bring. So don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Job lost everything halfway through his life. He lost it all. And was on the verge of death with illness. And lost his children, lost his family, lost his wealth, and sat there and looked the Grim Reaper right in the eyeball. And yet, he trusted in God, put his hope in God, and God restored him. And the Bible says the second half of his life was more blessed than the first. And if you knew the story of my dad's life, that was very much his life. Everything he had, everything he built, 38 years old, he lost it. Had to start all over. And yet, he just kept being faithful, kept serving God. And the second half of his life was more fruitful than the first. And many of you have eaten the fruit of that faith. In Israel, their temple was destroyed, their way of life was destroyed. But when they come back, their temple doesn't look as pretty, but it's more noble, and something more special happens there because Christ comes to it. And the second half is going to be greater than the first half. And I don't care what you've gone through or how bad it looks. If you'll put your faith in God and trust Him, don't go running off to Egypt. You don't need the world. The world is the every time from Abraham on, they'd go to Egypt when they got in trouble. And every time it turned out bad, bad, bad. Don't go to Egypt. 
Don't run to the worldly answer for deliverance. Trust in God. Be faithful. And God will do amazing things. He, well, everything I work for is, is lost. Okay? Start again. That's what it is to be a man. That's what, it, that's what it is. Is to have faith and put, put your faith in God and risk it all for Him and lose it all and start over again without complaining. That's what it is. That's what you do. You rejoice, you trust God, and you keep going. And His ability to restore is unparalleled. If He can create something from nothing, He can create something from you. Because you're more than nothing. He can do amazing things. So, they go and they won't listen. Um, Jeremiah eventually dies, but not before sending some really cool prophecies. And not before writing the book of Jeremiah and the book of Revelations, <coughs> which Jeremiah wrote. One of the prophecies Isaiah given, has given uh, came to be of uh, importance. God, promised, God made promises to Shem. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. He limited it, the, the Messiah, to the race of Shem. That God would dwell in the tents of Shem. Literally. He became the sin of Shem. Uh, that thy seed and all nations of the earth will be blessed. Uh, that was given to Abraham. The scepter will not depart from Judah. That's it. On your throne. <laughs> the throne of, and that Jesus sits on in heaven is the throne of David. Of the everlasting kingdom of David. So David was so faithful and wanted to build his house that God had promised him, I'm going to make your throne and my throne one and the same. And by the fruit of your body, I will sit on your throne. That's a prophecy. Therefore, bring the prophet, knowing that God has sworn on an oath that of the fruit of his loins, according to his flesh, I would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Acts chapter 2, verse 30. Paul, uh, not Paul, Peter, in the very first gospel sermon that was preached, quotes it. That's how it's fulfilled. The promises and the psalms David wrote, he wasn't talking about himself, he was prophesying about the Christ. When David, when David wrote Psalm 22, he wasn't writing that psalm about his own life. He was writing that psalm from the perspective of his ancestor, who would be the Christ. And that's how it was fulfilled. So, it was limited to the house of David, and God gave a promise concerning a virgin. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and called his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So it's limited to an individual born of a virgin. So now we're seeing from Isaiah and his prophecies, the Messiah is going to be born of a woman, from Noah, from Shem, from Abraham, from Isaac, from Jacob, from Judah, from the house of Jesse, from the fruit of the body of David. And so, and God is going to be in him and sit on David's throne through him. And he's going to be called... God with us. So now we have the virgin birth and the divinity of Jesus prophesied in the Old Testament. If God, Jesus isn't God, as the, our Jehovah Witness friends declare, how was that fulfilled? How did God sit on David's throne through his own flesh if Jesus isn't God? How could Jesus be called God with us if he wasn't God with us? And so Jesus and his divinity is prophesied. It's not just a new teaching in the New Testament. The divinity of Jesus is taught in the Old Testament. In fact, all the proofs for the divinity of Jesus that the apostles used to prove his divinity, such as Paul in Hebrews chapter 1, are by quoting Old Testament scriptures and his prophecies. So, um, Satan knew at the time of captivity that the royal seat of the house of David, the tribe of Judah, had to be killed or be made eunuchs. And that's why he gets the king of Babylon to castrate a bunch of the princes of Israel, which was common practice at the time. You defeat a king, you take his educated elite, who had been the princes 
You castrate them at a young age and make them your manservants to help you uh, do everything and run everything. And that's that's what Daniel was. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. They were descendants of David who had been castrated and turned into eunuchs and made slaves. And uh, that's uh, and I'll just say that we often talk about, we often equate courage to testosterone. But I dare you to find me more brave men in the Bible than Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. What it is to be brave in man isn't a physical thing. It's a in here thing. And uh, they have. They were men of courage. Name somebody risk their life more day in a more courageous way. You can't find more courageous men than those four men. Satan succeeded in killing the Masonic line, the Messianic line, except those who escaped to Babylon. The Jews hung up their harps, and uh, but those of the royal seed had uh, been preserved. There was still cause for rejoicing. Satan had not killed off all the seed of Abraham and David. And so that's when, after the fall of Jerusalem, that's when Jeremiah writes Lamentations. Uh, those who remained and went to Egypt would suffer destruction in the land of Egypt. Look what Jeremiah writes. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will set my face against you for evil, and cut off all Judah. I will take the remnant of Judah that I have set their faces to go to the land of Egypt to sojourn there, and they shall be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt, they shall be consumed by, sword, by famine, they shall die from the least to the greatest, by the sword, by the famine, and they shall uh, be an exoration in the land, an astonishment, and curse, and a reproach, for I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt, as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. So that none of the remnant of Judah, which has gone to the land of Egypt, sojourn there, shall escape or remain, and they shall, nor shall they return to the land of Judah, which they desire to return and dwell there. For none shall return, but such, uh, but such shall escape. Both Israel in the north and Judah in the south have now fallen into captivity, and the prophets mourned it. The Lord rejected the seed of Israel and afflicted them, delivered them to the hands of the spoilers until he cast them out of his sight. Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen. Holy cities are in the wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Look at Lamentations. How did the, how did the city sit solitary? It was full of people. It has now become a widow. She that was great among the nations and princes among the promises, she has become a tributary. She weepeth sore at night, her tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she hath gone to come, none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction. And because of great servitude, she dwelt among the heathen. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. The ways of Zion do mourn because none come to the solemn feast. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted. She is a bitterness. Her adversaries are the chief of her enemies prosper. And the Lord has afflicted the multitude for her transgression. Her children have gone into captivity before the enemy. And scattered among them, the heathen, they were dispersed throughout the countries according to the way and according to their doings I judged them. For they scattered them like the whirlwind among the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them. No man passed through nor returned. For they laid the pleasant land desolate. You guys remember, have you ever read about um, the Sabbath years? Did you know that in the law of Moses, every seven years, you were not to plant nor harvest? You had to, for six years, save up extra to eat during the seventh year. And during the seventh year, you would let your land sit idle and not plant on it. So why would God have such a law? Well, we know now that if you farm and farm and farm something, that it'll eat up all the nutrients of the land. So in that seventh year, you just let it grow up wild, you just let it sit, and that allowed you to, the land, to be refurbished. Now today, we do things different. We're able to add nutrients and stuff through fertilizer and stuff like that. And also, we alternate crops 
you know, up where I'm at, they, if they grew corn one year, the next year they grow soybeans to not take the same nutrients. Um, some people today who do uh, sustainable farming, they'll plant one part and not another part of the land. They'll keep their animals on one part, and then the next year they'll switch them, and the animals will eat the grass and leave behind what they leave behind, which then fertilizes the ground and allows it to plant. So we understand now these concepts. God knew it too, and that's why he had that law where everything had to sit. And they would just put their animals out on their on their fields those years. The animals would leave behind their fertilizer. And God knew what he was doing. But the Israelites in their wickedness, they had not kept that. And so their crops weren't as good. But they had they, they had not done that for and the Bible tells us in another verse how many years. And when you add it up, I think it's like 490 years ago. Like when you add it up, they had skipped 70 Sabbath years. And so how long does God put them in captivity and leave the land sit idle? 70 years. You don't do what God says, and you don't keep his Sabbath, uh, he'll get it out to you another way. If, if you, in greed, don't obey God, and you think, well, I'm not going to give this money to the church. I'm not going to give my tithe and offering to the church because I need it for these bills or I need to save up for my retirement or I need it to buy this or that. You think you're going to keep that money? No. No. The repairman will get it when your car breaks down. The, the, uh, the, the roofing guy will get it. The Appliance will get it. The electrician will get it. He'll take your money. He'll take it. Uh, you, the, somebody will get it. The furnace guy, the HVAC people. You won't keep that money. Malachi talks about people who rob God. They, they put their money in purses with holes in it. You don't rob God. You don't just. If, if you won't rest, he'll he'll get the rest. It's going to get its rest. One way or the other. You can go along with God the easy way, or you can go along with God the hard way. But you're going along with God. And, uh, you know, your choice. They chose poorly. And off to captivity they went. Um, captivity and Syria Babylon were dark days for the nation of Jacob. And for the prospect of salvation from the, from the tribe of Judah, David's descendants were not on the throne. But God was still on his throne. <laughs> I like that. There's no cause for worry. Satan would be destroyed in due time. Sometimes it seems like the devil's winning. But he's not. Because God is way ahead in the, in the chess game. So there's promises. Look at Jeremiah. The whole land shall be just like, yet I will not make it full into it. <laughs> it's not over. I will leave a remnant that you may that ye may have some rest and shall escape the sword among the nations and ye shall be scattered throughout the countries. And it shall come to pass in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts, two thirds therein shall be cut off and die, but one third shall be left therein. Two thirds you're going to die, but a third you're going to survive. And yet for that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly, to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. Maybe you didn't keep the covenant, but I'm keeping the covenant. God always keeps all his promises. You guys, there's one thing you can count on, and that's the promises of God. They're going to come, and the gates of hell will prevail against them. God's promises are going to come true. And if he promised to be with you, then he's going to be. And I know it seems like sometimes Satan won. And you're tempted to think, oh, those bad people did those bad things and bad came. Yeah. But those who really love the Lord, really, they're going to be okay. They will sustain it. God won't forsake you. He won't leave you. And 
he has a, he has a way of punishing people when they do wrong, but when they turn back to him and they trust in him, he has a way of bringing things around. And that seed planted has a way of coming out and producing fruit again later. And um, Israel was cut off down to the stump. But you know what happens if you cut a tree down to the stump? It'll sprout. And another tree will grow back. And that's what happens. That's what the Bible talks about, the root of Jesse. The a shoot is going to spring forth. A branch is going to come out of Jesse. See, the house of Jesse was not utterly destroyed. You say, but Kendall, Jephaniah was cursed that none of his descendants would sit on the throne. Yeah, it was cut down to the stump. But there was the son of David named Nathan. And his family branches out. And that's where the branch of the Messiah is going to come from. And yeah, the devil cut it down to the root. But he didn't get the root. He didn't get everyone. And God restores them back. So, there are promises of salvation. That ye may be increased, and they are not diminished. The Jews were taken service. But many of the, uh, Judah were made units. Men such as Daniel, uh, Meshach, Tedrach, Abednego. Uh, these were trying days for the Jews. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept, for we remembered the time. We hung our hearts uh, on the willows in the midst thereof. For there they carried us away captive, and acquired of us a song that they, that they wasted mirth. Sing to us one of the songs of Zion, how shall we sing in the Lord's song in a strange land? I forget thee, O Jerusalem. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem, Above my chief joy. You get what they're saying? Yeah? Let me let my hands forget how to play the guitar before I forget Jerusalem. Let my tongue stick to the root of my mouth before I sing and forget the desolation of Jerusalem. And so they hung up their, their music. And by the way, just as a side note, Name a time where there was not a great restoration and revival of God's people where there was not jubilant instrumental worship. Now, like uh, the time King David became king and brought back the Ark of the Covenant. What did he do as he brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem? He got down. There was music, there was singing, there he was dancing in the streets. He took off his coat, he was, you know. And his wife's like, oh, how glorious is the king of Israel in front of all the girls. <laughs> He's like, I'll become more undignified than that. <laughs> you think that's bad? Wait, wait till I really party. Uh, when, when we're going to see the uh, second half tonight, they come back and rebuild. They, they play musical instruments, they sang, and they rejoice. They put up their, their instruments for a little bit when they were Singing the blues, I guess. But that wasn't forever. And every time you have great revival, you have uh, instrumental worship being a part of it. Like whether it's the building of the Temple of Solomon, or whether it's the, uh, the time of Hezekiah, when there's a great revival, the time of Josiah, when there's a great revival, you know, or the rebuilding during Nehemiah and Ezra, there's always jubilant song. And when people throw off the hindrances, uh, there should be some worship and some joy in that. Because God is God is delivered. If anybody ought to be singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, encouraging one another or singing and worship, it should be us. Because if there's ever been a comeback story in the world, it's Jesus Christ, death on the cross and his resurrection, and what he's doing in your life. And how you died of sin, were buried in, in the water, and came up out alive. If anybody has had a revival in their life, it's us. And if anybody ought to be singing praise to God daily, the, those verses sing songs and spiritual songs, that's not talking about church. That's talking about you, individually. You need to be daily praising God and singing to God. He deserves it. And it, it ought to be in, in your heart. And, uh, you know, whatever people love, 
and are really into, they're going to write a song about it. I remember 1988 when the the Bears and the Bengals in the Super Bowl. They they had to, they even had a dumb song, the Super Bowl Shuffle. People in Chicago were so excited to be in the Super Bowl they wrote a dumb song. <laughs> when you get Refrigerator Perry singing, there's some joy. And when we are when we have joy in our, they're already singing. But they weren't singing. They. Uh, Judah, from whom the Messiah would come, was desolate. Her people wept. Um, they were left without hope of... Um, but God promised the Savior that he would yet come. Hell could not prevail against these promises that God made. So off they go into captivity. Okay? And so the book of Daniel, um, they're taken into captivity. And uh, the prophecy of Hezekiah's descendants uh, becoming eunuchs uh, that would serve for the king of Babylon uh, becomes true. Remember, Hezekiah was told... Your descendants are going to be eunuchs. And there they are. Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a few examples of men of Judah who served in Nebuchadnezzar. Satan tried to prompt these men to eat unclean food. Um, but they would not touch the dainties, and they were honored for their faithfulness. So the problem, remember, with um, the problem with the food that the, the king offered them from the kingly table is that it was been sacrificed to idols. People like say, see ya. Uh, Daniel said, I can check the bed and go, they eat a vegetarian diet. We shouldn't eat meat. See, we should have a Daniel diet. They didn't have a problem with eating meat. They had a problem with eating food that had been sacrificed to an idol. They also wouldn't drink the wine. Are you going to stop your alcoholism? Okay. Let's go there. Uh, oh, we're going to keep talking about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, they wouldn't drink the wine because it had been sacrificed to idols. So what hadn't been sacrificed to idols? The fruits, the vegetables, and the water. Because nobody really sincerely thanks God for fruits and vegetables. <laughs> that. No one goes to their pagan gun, thank you for this salad. You know. My dad used to joke that because uh, one time he was eating salad, we hadn't prayed yet, and he said, Dad, that shouldn't we, we pray before we eat? And he said, Oh, we'll pray before the main course. He said, we don't want to pray for salvation. We're not really thankful for it. <laughs> God, we know our insincere prayer. We're not here. <laughs> My dad, with all that salad dressing and uh, meat you put on that salad, it's not really a salad. <laughs> it's kind of a meat soup with a little lettuce. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they. They went into captivity and they wouldn't eat this, the king's dainties. And so they go and they risk their lives to say, hey, we won't eat this. And then what they thought was when you eat the food sacrificed to the idols, it makes you strong. That because this food had been sacrificed, you're going to be stronger and healthier. You're going to run faster and jump higher if you eat the meat sacrificed to these idols. And so they refused to eat it. And the guy first wouldn't let him. He says, no, I can't let you eat it. He said, Let's test it out. Let's test it out. And if, if we're wimpy and weak afterwards, and it makes you look bad to the king, then we'll go and do that too. He's like, oh, all right. And so they give it a test run. And after the time period, they come back. They're stronger. And, and hey, that really is a miracle. I mean, you need protein uh, to look healthy. And, and uh, so they were just eating vegetables. So it really kind of was the fact that they were more toned and in shape, or I don't know whether they were doing, I don't know what else they were doing. They were doing some work out or something. But they look really good when the guy says, all right, you don't got to eat the meat sacrifice items. And so Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like, we, we were saying we did wrong, our ancestors did, and that's what got us into this captivity. And if we want to get out of this captivity and fulfill the words of the prophet Jeremiah in return, we got to be faithful. And so there was a generation there of young men who said, our fathers messed it up and they weren't faithful. And that's what got us into this trouble. But we, we're going to be faithful. May God send us such a generation today. May God raise up a generation of young men today. He says, hey, the church hasn't been faithful. And that's why the church is in decline. That's why our country is in decline. And we're going to turn back to God. And we're going to be faithful. And we're not going to bow the knee uh, to idols. We're not going to eat food sacrifice. We're going to go along with the world. We'll risk everything to do what's right. 
And that's that's where they were. Um, and, you know, then they have you know he has the dream at night, right? He uh, um, he sees the Nebuchadnezzar sees the statue, and so he tells him the meaning of it that he's the head of gold. He lets that go to his head and builds a ninety foot statue of himself made of gold, and says everybody bow down and whoosh. Uh, and so they wouldn't bow down in Nebuchadnezzar, right? Um, Daniel made many wonderful prophecies, hundreds of other prophecies concerning Christ. He, he foretold Christ's glorious kingdom um, that would appear. I saw a night vision of gold, one like the Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near him. And there he was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom of all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. His kingdom, which shall not be destroyed. Who is that? Who did he see coming from the clouds of heaven? Jesus. And see, this is what Jesus is referencing when he's on trial. Right? Remember they said, you know, uh, um, tell us straight out, I conjure you. He used a, a legal move, the high priest did, that, that forced Jesus to testify. Jesus wouldn't say anything. They'd ask the question to his silent. He had the right to remain silent unless he was conjured under Jewish law. Well, then the high priest used that legal move. I conjure you. I force you to testify. Are you the Christ? And he says, yeah, as you say. And, and someday, you're going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. He starts referencing this prophecy. That's, he was claiming to be this one that Daniel spoke of. And they're like, and then, then he gets up and rips it. Oh, what more do we need to hear? Let's go. Because he was claiming to be God. He was claiming to be the Messiah and to be God. And uh, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Um, Seventy weeks are determined upon the people of the old holy city to finish the transgression, make an end of sin, reconciliation for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from going forth the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, Prince of Peace, is seven weeks, three score and two weeks. And the street shall again be built again in the walls and even in troubled times, which it was troubled times when they rebuilt the wall. Um, after three score, two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off and not up for himself, and the people and the prince shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof, and with the flood and to the end of the war, desolations are returned. So here Jeremiah is predicting that Jerusalem's going to rebuild, the Messiah's going to come, and then the city's going to be rejected and destroyed. He's predicting the rebuilding, he's re predicting Jesus' death, and he's predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. And he's telling when. He's giving the time of when. So, um, the prophecies of, of both our first and second coming of Christ, his ascension, his resurrection, are found in Daniel's prophecy. In fact, Israel's being held captive in this land, the whole ancient world came to know of the promised Messiah. Many times, this is so. Greatness is revealed during times of tribulation or oppression. The Savior of Israel will become the desire of nations. He, and I will make shake nations. The desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill his house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. So because the Jews are spread all over, and take this message all over, all the nations know of this coming promised Messiah. And the Messiah of the people of Israel becomes common knowledge because of these prophecies and because they were expected. That's why the Magi are looking for him. That's why they come and visit Jesus. Hey, we saw the star, according to the prophecy. Messiah's supposed to be here. We're here to worship him. They knew who he was. He was the desire of nations. Um, because it spread. Um, so the majority of prophets are prophesied before captivity. Um, and uh, then... Um, oops. Uh, so before, prior... I think we talked about this last week when we talked about prophets. I showed you the start. Um, these are the ones before, these are the ones during the captivity, and these are the ones after. Um, so then there's a plot to kill all the Jews. Um, in the book of Esther, it tells of a young maiden named Esther, her name was actually in Hebrew, Hadessa, um, which meant star. <laughs> and uh, 
And so she was renamed Esther, which was their term, it was based on one of their goddesses of the Medo Persians. Um, and she won a beauty contest and was made queen. <laughs> her first, his first wife uh, was commanded to become a dance before all of his buddies at a drunken party and do the hoochie coochie for her. And she thought that was below the dignity of the queen and refused. And so he got rid of her and uh, felt kind of lonely. And so his friends said, hey, let's have a beauty contest and find your new wife, which they did. And she won the Miss Persia contest. <laughs> And she was married off to him. And he loved her. And he didn't know it, but she was Jewish. So that was a secret. Now, she had been raised, because her parents had died, she had been raised by a cousin who was older than her. You know, sometimes cousins are way older. Well, this older cousin, um, Mordecai, had kind of raised her. And so they were close. And he happened to be uh, a guard that worked at the gate of the palace. Now there was uh, the main advisor, you know, he was the second uh, in command, so to speak. He was the main advisor that this king listened to, a guy named Haman. And he was a descendant of the people that... Uh, um, that King Saul was supposed to kill them all. And you remember King Saul didn't kill them all? And so this guy's ancestor escaped. If Saul had done what God told him to do, none of this would have happened. But because of Saul not killing them all, this guy <coughs> survived, and now he hates Jews because they killed all his ancestors. And he particularly hates one Jew, Mordecai, who's a guard, because when he comes in, everybody knows he's important, so they all bow down to him. Mordecai doesn't bow down to anybody but God. So Mordecai would stand there. And he brought out to me. Well, I don't know about you. So he hated the Jews. And he wants to get them killed. So Haman, who's friends with the king, goes to the king and says, Hey boss, you know there's some people that have long trouble. All the kings of the earth are always rebellious. They're really bad people. They're causing trouble in your kingdom. The king's like, oh, really? Yeah, they really are. You know, I really think that you should get rid of them. He says, well, that would, that would be too troublesome. He says, I'll tell you what you do. I'll make you a deal. You pass a law that on a certain day, we're allowed to kill them and take their possessions. I'll give you what I think is roughly today $14 million. I'll give you $14 million. I'm getting rid of your enemies. But my pain is, like, what's in it for you? Well, I get to keep the loot from any of the people, the Jews we kill. I get to keep all the possessions. I make money. You make money. Enemy of Persia destroyed. It's a win-win, boss. Well, all right. And so we passed the law. Now, you guys know that in Medo Persia, if a king passed a law, he couldn't revoke it. It was in the Constitution. So he wasn't allowed to undo it once he did. So... What Haman doesn't know, and what the king doesn't know, is he just passed a law that his wife is now to be killed. And Haman, being a true heathen pagan, doesn't just go do it. He consults witchcraft and, and, and his astrologers, and his, you know they ask the bones and all this kind of weird stuff that pagans do, and it told him a day to do it. It was in the future. So he set that day as the date that it would happen. But what that did is that gave time for the Jews and for God to respond to what he was doing. So the word went out that this was to happen on a certain day, that, hey, it's kill a Jew for free day. Literally, that was, you could kill a Jew and take your stuff that day. It became legal on that day. By the order of the king. And there's no revoking. And so the devil had God, this wicked man who was a descendant of a wicked people, who were supposed to be killed, but Saul didn't do it. Along with this dumb king, who was always being pushed around by his servants, hey, let's see your wife dance. Well, okay. You know, he's just a manipulated monarch by his treacherous wise men. And now he's got manipulated and passed the law that his own wife dies. And he didn't know. And so, um, meanwhile, Mordecai, 
her cousin, had heard about a plot to kill the king. And he went and told his higher-ups, who then investigated and found this plot, and they captured the guys that were going to try to assassinate the king. And the king's life was saved by Mordecai. But in all of the excitement and confusion about it, no one ever thanks Mordecai. And so some time passes, and Mordecai goes to Esther, his cousin, sends her a message. She's in the palace. She's the queen. He says, hey, you need to do something. You need to go talk to the king and fix this problem because we're all going to die on this certain day. And she's like, well, who am I to do that? He, he has to invite me in. If I go into the presence of the king uninvited, they'll kill me. If anybody who goes into the presence of the king without an invitation, if he doesn't raise his staff the moment they come in, the guards just kill him. He, if he doesn't raise his scepter, I'm dead. You're asking me to get myself killed. He said, do you think you're going to escape on that day? Maybe you were put here and you were put in that position as queen for such a time as this. Now you go in there and talk to the king. And she said, okay, I will. Pray for three days. Get everybody to pray for me and fast and I'll go in. Well, in the meantime, the king can't sleep. And so he calls in one of his servants and says, read to me the official annals of my, uh, my court. Because nothing puts me to sleep like when we have to read the minutes for a meeting. <laughs> Don't you hate when you have to read the minutes and then approve them? Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so the guy starts reading good. And then there was a plot to kill the king of a guard named Mordecai. I uh, overheard the plot and told the... the royal guard and they were able to stop the plot and kill the bad guys and the king's life was saved and then on the next day we all had fried chicken and you know, you know just going through the Wrong time. and then uh then we passed the budget for you know whatever and, and the king's like wait wait wait, wait, wait back up well, what do we do for that uh that uh the guy that's in like the, the mortar what's his name mordecai what do we do for him oh uh, well, nothing sir guy saves my life can you do anything for him what kind of king am I? Well, we need to do something, right? And by this time, it's like early in the morning. And Mordecai I'm, is, is, is out there as his guard, and the king wants to bless him. Now remember, Haman hates Mordecai. He's passed a whole law to kill a whole group of people just to kill one dude. He hates. Got some hatred. He hates Mordecai. And just at that time, as the king sitting there, who, what do I do for him? I got to do something for him. Dude, what, do you, you can't just send a thank you card and a gift certificate to the Outback. You gotta, we we got to we gotta do something better. What should I do for him? The servant's like, I don't know what to do for him. I don't, what do you do for somebody that saves your life? Well, we can get him a new chariot. I don't know. What it's, uh, uh, I don't know what to, and so just then, Haman walks in. Hey, boss. Hey, 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 hey. I got a question. I got a question. I got a question. Yeah, how would it? If you hit somebody that you really loved and appreciated and wanted to honor them, I mean, really, really honor them, what would you do? And Haman was so vain, he thought the king was asking what he should do for him. And he wanted nothing more than to force Mordecai to bow to him under penalty of death. So he went. Well, I know what I'd do if I wanted to honor someone. Be honest, if you really have someone special that you want to do something nice for, what I would do is I would put a royal robe on him, a royal ring, dress him up like you as king, put him on your own horse. Yeah, Air Horse One. <laughs> 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 we know, we know. Nobody <laughs> asked you, Clark. Okay, no, no. I thought it was good. I didn't say it was bad. He said, well, we know. But anyway, he puts him on the horse. Never heard it before. And he says, and then parade him around and tell everyone, you've got to bow to him. And say, this is how the king treats those he wants to honor. <laughs> And then much to Haman's chagrin, the king says, great, that's perfect. 
Go do that right now for more decay out of it. Dum, dum, dum. So he has to go get the guy he hates. Put a royal robe on him. Hog around on Air Force One going, This is how the king treats. Bow before this. This is how the king treats those who wants to. I mean, this is, a, this is classic God. <laughs> this has just, oh, it's just hysterical. And so he prayed to... <laughs> it's break time, I shut you off. He prays him around, and I'm going to finish his story. He prays him around, and that's, well, then the day is coming. So, Hadessa, or yes, Esther, she gets up the courage, and she just waltzes right into the king's throne room, risking her life. And he liked it, so he raised his staff, and she didn't die. He said, what you want? I'll give you anything you want. Good to see you, babe. You've been missing me. Oh, <laughs> coming in here risking your life. See your old man. What can, I, what can I do for you, babe? I'll give you anything. What you need? A credit card? You know, whatever, you know. When you go shopping, she goes, and she chickened out. She said, well, uh, 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 I just wanted you and um, Haven to come to dinner. I want to make you dinner. All right, huh? When? And he sets the date. And now Haman's like, ooh, even the queen's inviting me over to dinner. And, and so she goes, they show up, and she chickens out again. What do you want? Oh, I do. Uh, I want you to come back tomorrow night. And she just, she's afraid. And so finally, the next day comes back, the next meal. Now, come on now, honey. What do, you, what do you want? You're wanting something more than just to make us a meal. And she says, well, she gets the courage and she says, to be honest, honey, you passed a law that me and all my people should be killed and you were tricked into doing it. And he's like, who? Who did it? Wicked Haman. <laughs> and points at the guy. And he must have choked on <laughs> <laughs> And the king is so mad, he gets up, busts out of the dining room, out onto the deck, and he's like, wow, the payment is tricking me. These guys are always manipulating. I lost my first wife, now I'm going to lose my second wife. And, these guys are, and he's furious. Meanwhile, Haman knows he is in big trouble. He built gallows to kill Mordecai, to hang Mordecai on the guy he just had to haul around and say was the, how he was honored by the king. And he's like, he falls down in front of Esther. Oh, please. And tell him not to have mercy on me. Oh, please. Please help me. Oh, and he's like, Megan. She's like, get off me. And he's like, hold on her. And she tries to pull away. And he's like grabbing on her coat or her dress or whatever. And then the king walks back in. And here's the guy's hanging on his wife. He's like, what are you going to do on top of this? you going to rape my wife? I don't know what to do with you. And one of the guards standing there, probably one of Mordecai's friends. So, well, you know we just built a three-story tall gallon to kill more <laughs> And he's like, take him, hang him on it. And he who rolls a stone and rolls back on him, and he who builds a, he who digs a pit, he falls in it, and he who builds a gallon gets hung on. And he was killed. And then he goes to Mordecai and says, what do I do? He says, Mordecai says, pass a law that the Jews can arm themselves and have self-defense. And so he does. And so the day comes when he was killed a Jew day, and the Jews were all armed to the teeth and ready to defend. And not many people killed many Jews that day. Other people died. And God saved the Jews because of one woman's courage. And um, so she creates a holiday thereafter called the Festival of Lights, and uh, we call it Hanukkah. And that's what that's all about. Now, God didn't ordain that holiday. Um, but say what you want about it. Jesus celebrated it. <laughs> because the Bible talks in the New Testament about Jesus celebrating the festival of life. And so um, that's where that comes from. And Esther literally saved the, the Jews from being exterminated. See how the devil is just trying to kill them all? And then eventually... Esther has a child with that king. And, by the way, uh, Mordecai becomes the main advisor. He, become, he takes Haman's place, he becomes the main advisor. And so now, they're the main advisor 
for the king. And who is that son of Esther? King Cyrus, who sends the Jews back, lets them rebuild the wall, lets them rebuild. He was half Jew. The king of Persia was trained and brought up by this brave, courageous woman, Esther. And so her son fulfills the prophecy that Jeremiah and Isaiah had made. And that's how the restoration is going to happen. So we're going to stop right there and take our 10-minute uh, oatmeal cream pie. <laughs> So, what have we covered? We have covered creation, the fall of man, the flood, the Tower of Babel, the call of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the bondage of Egypt, the Exodus, the giving of the law, the conquest, the judges, the kings, the temple, the divided kingdom, the prophets, and then the captivity. And so now we are ready for the restoration. <laughs> which we are going to symbolize <laughs> too much with a hammer. <coughs> so just picture that uh, little ball and chain being clobbered by a hammer. And God is going to lead him out of captivity. Now, that king who came after, oh, Esther's son, he had a Jew as his wine tasting. So all of these Jews had been moved into positions of importance and prominence. Uh, and the king, God kept doing that. Who's he put in charge of Babylon? Daniel and Jeremiah Shek of And then after they come out of, they get removed by uh, the wicked grandson of Nebuchadnezzar after Nebuchadnezzar's death. But then God puts Daniel back in charge into that first king uh, in Babylon. That's the, that whole thing with Daniel and the lions did. And you can see in that story how the wise men and the advisors of the king are wicked. And then that guy has gets Esther and then now Mordecai, after Daniel's death, ends up as a Jewish advisor to the king. And then uh, he gets a whole bunch of other people into positions of preeminence. So you're always worried about someone poisoning the king's food. So whoever the, the cupbearer of the king is has to be a very trusted official. And so a guy named Nehemiah gets that job for Esther's uh, husband. Uh, I'm sorry, not Esther's husband, for Esther's son. And so he's the cupbearer, and his brother goes back to Jerusalem, goes back to Judea, and on a business trip, and sees what Jerusalem is like. And they didn't realize how bad it was. Uh, they knew it had been destroyed, but they didn't know it was utterly devastated. And he comes back and tells Nehemiah the news. And Nehemiah is just sick about it. And he knows that it had been prophesied that after 70 years, they didn't go rebuild. And so he prays to God. He says, look, God, you promised we could go back. You, it, it, the time is now, according to the prophecy. So, Lord, I, I want to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. He knew God's promise. He knew God wanted it done. He knew by providence God had placed him into a position where he had access to the king. And so he kind of had that same moment that Esther had. I was put here for such a time as this. I have this opportunity. I have this desire. I have this ability. I'm going to go for it. And when you know the will of God, and you know the promises of God, and you know what God's will is, you know what he wants done, and you know it's time to do it, and God has given you the desire to do it, and God's given you the ability to do it, and God's given you the opportunity to do it, for crying out loud, have some faith and do it. So, well, how do I know what God wants me to do? Well, what, what does he put in your heart, giving you a passion for? What has he promised to do and be with you as you do it? And what is he giving you the opportunity and the ability to do? That's what God wants you to say. And there's somewhere where you have, the, the, you know what the will of God is, you know it needs done, you know God wants it done, and you have the opportunity, and you have the ability, then say a prayer like you didn't do it. Now, you weren't allowed to be 
sad in the presence of the king. That would be a rule I would like. I wish I could have it where nobody was a, a Debbie Downer uh, or you know whatever. Nobody was nobody's a depressed or negative in my presence. I would, I'd like that rule on Facebook. Um, so much negativity. He had this rule that nobody was even allowed to be sad in his presence. That was one of the rules of the Medo Persian Empire. But Nehemiah, he couldn't help. It. And so he went before the king and he wasn't happy, happy, joyful. And the king's like, What is this? Someone without a big, happy smile on their face in my presence. And the king says, why aren't you acting happy? Now this was capital offense here. Nehemiah says a prayer under his breath. God be with me. And he says to the king, how can I be happy when the city of my forefathers is in ruin and the temple is destroyed? He was not ignorant of these things. His mom had taught him what that was about. And Little did Nehemiah know that God had already come to him and told him, hey, you need to go back and rebuild my temple. And he says, what is it you want to do? And he says, well, since you asked, I'm going to take this many guys back. I need this many horses. I need this much money. I need this much money. That's why I like you came with a plan. He didn't just have some wish high in the sky. He thought about it. And now the king goes, Okay, here's this guy I trust, who I trust with my life every day. And he's thought it out, he's got a plan, he knows how much resources he needs. Don't just go ask, hey, can I do this without a plan? He went in, prayed, got it first, fasted and prayed for a period of time, goes in, says a little prayer under his breath before he acts, and asks the king, and then he has a plan. And the king goes, you've been thinking about this. <laughs> go do it. And he funds him, and he pays for it, and he sends him. He gives him letters of passage with the king's seal on it, and he sends him, and he goes back. Nehemiah goes back in very troubled times in a very unstable area uh, on the outskirts, really, of the Persian Empire. Amongst a bunch of nations that are still rebellious and don't like the king. And rebuilds the wall. And it's really interesting. One of the interesting things is uh, while they're building, there's this constant threat of people are going to attack them and kill them. And so the guys who were building, it says they had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. They were putting a brick in, troweling it up, and had a sword. They were ready to fight at any time. He had given instructions, and uh, he had a trumpet, and the guy with the trumpet with him. And if they were attacked, they were all given instructions. He and I have the trumpet for all to go to where the trumpet is and fight in that area. And they posted people at, at places in the wall, and they rebuilt. And it tells who rebuilt, and what part of the wall they rebuilt, and who did it. And they did it by families and by tribes. And one of them is even women. You know, these Jewish women out there, they have their sword. And they're, they're, uh, this guy didn't have any sons, all he had was daughters, so it was just him and his girl. So, you know, they have the book, Annie Oakley section of the. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they rebuilt the wall. And now the city was rebuilt. It was empty, but it was rebuilt. And now they could rebuild the temples. Uh, when the walls were finished in the days of Nehemiah, Nehemiah told the states there were few people there. And then the houses were not yet built. It, it was at this time Cyrus gave the edict for the Jews to return to rebuild the temple of God. And Zerubbabel gathered together the people to build the temple. He said, who is Zerubbabel? A descendant of David. <clears throat> But not, but of me. And so God, now he, he's made governor. He's not king. But he's made governor of Judea. And Zerubbabel is in, if you go back, you'll find him in the ancestry of Mary, mother of Jesus. Um, because he was this descendant of David and a godly man. Now, Satan must have been freaking out. Because now, the guy put in charge as governor to rebuild the temple was a male born of Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, 
Jesse did it. And he's going back and he's rebuilding. The, the walls are rebuilt in Jerusalem and the temple is being rebuilt. <coughs> Uh-oh. Everything's coming together from the side of him. Zerubbabel didn't meet all the qualifications, though. He didn't meet the one that Isaiah said. He wasn't born of a baby. So he couldn't be inside. But it's getting close. Uh-oh. So the devil starts resisting hardcore. And now all the people that came back, Sarah says, anybody that wants to go back can go back. And the first wave, they went with Nehemiah to rebuild. And then after that was done, he said, anybody wants to go back and rebuild the, the temple? I'm supposed to go build the temple of God. And he sends Zerubbabel and Ezra to go back and help rebuild the temple. So first the wall is built by a very few. And then um, anybody who wants to go back can go back. So these people were scattered, their slaves, their servants, all over. And by the order of King Cyrus, now anybody who wants to leave their masters and go back and become free men and women. And what's surprising to me is not all of you. A whole bunch of them decide they're comfortable in being a slave. See, some people would rather have the security of servitude than the freedom and the danger of freedom. And uh, not me. I choose freedom over servitude. I'd rather be in danger and responsible for myself than have the security of a house and a, and a payment and be somebody's servant. And so the only people who went back were people of courage and faith. The chicken lily livers were invited to the market. It was the courageous and the brave and those who trusted in God and loved Israel that got to go back. It was kind of a way to weed out the wimps. It's kind of a Gideon moment where God was whittling it down. Only 42,360 came back. Now they had some servants and some other people with them too. Roughly around 50,000 people. But 42,360 Jews came back. That's all. Now when they came up out of Egypt in the conquest of Joshua, they were two million plus. When, uh, when just Judah was around, after the king was divided, there were 700,000 just in Judah fighting them. And now they're down to 42,000 all 12 tribes. They are little down. They were truly cut off to a stone. And they come back to rebuild and do this restoration. restoration. So Haggai, uh, there's a, this call. Look what the prophet Haggai writes. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring down timber and build my house. So that I, will make, I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expect much, but you see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because my house which remains in ruin, while each of you is busy in your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the olive oil, and everything else that produces, on the people and the livestock, and all the labor of your hands. So they come back, 42,000 come back. There's no houses. And it's just like an empty city with the walls. And so they start building subdivisions. And they're building all these subdivisions. And Cyrus sent them there and funded them and sent them to build the temple, and they don't. And so he gave the order, but no one was doing it. God gave the order, no one's doing it. The temple isn't getting built. And so Haggai comes along and lays down some prophecy and says, Hey, you guys are planting, but you're not getting a good harvest, and things aren't working out for you. You're not, your, your animals aren't fruitful, you're not fruitful. I, I'm withholding my blessing. Because you're seeking first your kingdom, not mine. What Jesus told us to do is not work about what we'll eat or what we'll drink or where we'll live or all that kind of stuff. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. And we need to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. My dad always would say, you take care of the Lord's business and he'll bless your business. He won't give you out all of it, all your greed, but he'll meet all your need. And if you 
Put God's kingdom first. He will provide for you. He will take care of you. And so they were uh, convicted by this. And Zerubbabel, the son of Shudiel, and Joshua, the son of Zodiac, the high priest, and the whole room of people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai. Because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. When you make God's business your business, God will be with you. Right? Remember what Jesus said? Go into all the world. Make what? Disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey all I command. And love, I will be with you you to the very end of the age. Zerubbabel, this governor, is a type of Christ, an analogy, a foreshadow. The son of David, who comes and leads the rebuilding of the temple. But Jesus built a better temple. Not an earthly one built by human beings, but what? The temple that is the church. And he no longer sits in the most holy place on top of the Ark of the Covenant of the mercy seat. Now he is enthroned in our hearts. And now we are a royal priesthood, a holy people. We are the temple in which God dwells by his spirit. The church and when it is the kingdom of God. The church is the kingdom of God. It is the temple of God. It is the house of God. It is the family of God. And if you will focus on building the kingdom, the church. And you will make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything. If you will build up people, in the ch if you will put bricks in the wall, like Nehemiah, not of, of stone and mortar, but of souls, of people. Because now the Bible says, Peter says, we are living stones built together to make up the house of God, Right? It's, it's like that people point out. All in all, we're just another brick in the wall. We are stones, living stones in the temple of God. We are being built together to become a glorious temple of God. And when you dedicate yourself to the building of the God's church, He will be with you. He will bless you. He will make your life fruitful. And he can take you from a total loss and mess up life to becoming fruitful and impacting many, many other people. But you have to put God's work before your life. Jesus said, if you try to save your life, you lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. He said you have to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. The kingdom of God, the church, has to become your mission. That's why you're here. That's why you're still alive. That's why you're still breathing. You, you are saved as you're ever going to be the moment you came up out of the baptistry. The moment you came up out of the water when you were baptized, you're not more saved now than you were then. You were ready to go to heaven at that moment. So why has he left you here in this world full of pain and hurt and temptation? Because he wants you to add other bricks to the wall. He wants to use you to build up the kingdom of God. That's your mission. You're not here to be a nurse. You're not here to be a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher or a parent or a father or a mother. You're not, yeah, you might do those things, but that's not your main purpose for being. Your main purpose for being is to lead people to Jesus Christ, to build the temple. And don't go getting comfortable in your own paneled houses while the house of the Lord sits in disrepair. And I'm disturbed and bothered by how many people are uh, hunkered down, sheltering in their own homes, afraid to build the temple of God or be a part of the only temple of God because of uh, COVID. Look, I understand that, you know, an ox in the ditch, but that ox is out. 
And you, you're going to Walmart and you're going out to eat, then you need to go to church. And if you're, if you're taking care of your business and building your own house, you're still going to work. You're still, you're still going out buying food at the store. You're still treating yourself to dinner at the, you know, Golden Corral or something. I don't know where you're going. But if you're still going out, then you need to be in church and you need to be building God's kingdom. And it shouldn't be the last place you go back to. It should have been the first place you went back to. And it shouldn't be the last thought in your mind. It should be the first thought in your mind. And it should be the last thing you risk your life for. It should be the first thing you risk your life for. We need to be building the kingdom of God, the church. That's our mission. And that's when God will be with us. And that's when God will be protecting us. And the reason that there was plagues and there was pestilence and there was unfruitfulness and there was economic problems and there's all the problems they were having is because they weren't building the church in the first place. And maybe... The reason that we're in the predicament that we're in, and everything seems to be going to hell in a handbasket around us, is because we were never building the church in the first place. And we haven't been putting the church first in a while. And maybe if we'd have done that, we wouldn't have the uh, idiots in Washington we have, and we wouldn't have the oppression we have, and we wouldn't have the society that allowed the things that it's doing, and, and it wouldn't be fashionable for our, our leaders to uh, pass laws that you can kill a baby uh, when it's due the next day. It wouldn't be fashionable uh, for our leaders to uh, uh, allow perversion and immorality. Maybe we would be a different world, a different place, if we'd been building the church in the first place. We need to rebuild God's kingdom, the church. And if you're not a part of building a church somewhere, you're not in God's will. Period. And he is not with you. And he will not bless you. And if you're his child, he's about ready to let loose his belt on you. So get your act together and start building the temple. All right? We need some Zerubbabel's. We need some Joshua's. We need some leaders who are going to stand up and say, build the church. Build the kingdom of God. We've got to get back to building the kingdom. That's what counts. That's why we're here. That's what's important. That's what matters. And nothing else matters compared to the kingdom. You put your hand in the plow and don't look it back. Okay? Sacrifice. Pick up your cross. I know it's hard sometimes. I know it costs. Pick up your cross and follow him. And then we begin to work on the house of the Lord Almighty for God on the 24th day of the sixth month. All right, let's do it. And so they started. Now, it took years. But they started. They started to work on the devil. The devil isn't going to sit back and do nothing about that. Zechariah prophesied during these days, the rebuilding, he foretold that the branch would come out of Jesse and unite the throne and the priesthood into one office. Jesse was David's father. A descendant of Jesse was to be both king and priest. Look at Zechariah 6.13. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon the throne. And he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. I'm sure the devil will shake it in Oh, wait. His prophesied that the Messiah would come and rebuild the temple. And here's this descendant of David, Zerubbabel, rebuild the temple. Uh-oh. And then the priest is helping them. The priest and the king are together. They're, they're two separate offices. How is that going to work? How's that? How, and he, you know, I don't know. That nobody knew. There must have been surprising words. To the sons of Zerubbabel and uh, Josedek, the, the, the branch would come and grow up out of his place and build the temple of the Lord. Both offices would be on one man. Look what it says. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. Now, when does a priest have to sit? Do priests sit? No. Is there a chair in the temple? No. The only thing that could be called a seat in the temple was what was between the cherubim on the top of the Ark of the Covenant called the mercy seat. And the only one left.
<clears throat> How can it be priest of the king? How could all of this come to pass? Well, there was a fulfillment. So this branch, okay, remember that. The branch out of Jesse is going to be priest and king and sit on the throne. How does that? I'm sure the devil was scratching his head. The Bible says that uh, we now know, looking back in retrospect, we now know what the prophets were talking about. We know things that the prophets didn't understand when they wrote them, and that angels long creek that ran into a river that ran into the Sea of Galilee. And it was called the branch, because it was a branch off of a river. So, you know, we called it creek. You know, it was a little branch. And so it says in the Old Testament, he would be called the branch, and he would branch out of Jesse. And why was Jesus called the branch? Because Jesus' biological father was not Joseph, and they knew it. And so, the Jews liked to insult Jesus and insinuate he was a bastard, and so they would call him Jesus of Nazareth to insult him. So all the Pharisees and Sadducees and all those people, they called him Jesus of Nazareth to insult him. And every time they insulted him, calling him Jesus of Nazareth, they were fulfilling this prophecy, that he would be called the branch. He was called Jesus of the branch. He fulfilled the prophecy. And the branch would come, and he grew up uh, in Nazareth. He fulfilled the royal line of Jeconiah. Why? Because Joseph was a descendant of this Jeconiah who was cursed. And he couldn't, nor any of his physical descendants couldn't sit on the throne, right? But Jesus was his adopted son. Still, through Mary, a descendant of David and of the flesh of David, but not under the curse of Jeconiah, because Joseph wasn't his father. And so the fact that he was not of Joseph's parentage is why he was called the branch and why he got around the curse of Jeconiah and he could be the Messiah and sit on the throne forever. He was of Nathan's line, thus the fruit of David's own flesh. He serves not as a priest on earth where only Levites can serve. In fact, the Bible says he, Jesus can't be a priest on earth. That's how I know he's never going to come back and be on, reign on earth again. It's because... He's, it says in Hebrews he's our high priest forever. And it says in Hebrews that he can't be a priest on earth. He can only be a priest in heaven. That's why when Jesus comes back, we don't meet him on the ground. We meet him in the air. Jesus didn't come back on earth. Um, so he serves in the true holy place of heaven. He ever lives and is in the order of Melchizedek. His offering, once offered and accepted by God, allowed him to sit down. You see, the priests, they had to keep offering because... Their, their offerings, their sacrifices were only symbolic of what Jesus would ultimately do. And so they had to keep offering them again and again because it never fully paid for the sin of man. But when Jesus offers his own blood shed on the cross through a new and living way, he literally paid for all sin of all time, uh, past, present, future. He paid for all sin. And now the priest doesn't need to stand anymore and minister because uh, that part's done. I'll sit down. And Jesus sits down at the right hand of God. He is both priest and king on his throne. Just as prophesied on the throne of David and the throne of God. Now they're one throne. And he built the true temple of God, which is the church. Whose temple we are, because his spirit dwells in us. He dwells, the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. When we're baptized into Christ, we receive the forgiveness of sins and... The gift of the Holy Spirit. He, he lives in us. He rules from his throne in heaven. Heaven is his throne, not earth. Earth is his footstool. The Messiah never intended to rule from his footstool. He rules from his throne. And he makes intercession. He is priest and he is king on his throne. So he is the son of man, a prophet. He is the son of David, king. And he is the Son of God, our High Priest, on the throne. And that's why, when the wise men come, they give him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is a gift for a king, frankincense is a gift for a priest, myrrh is a gift for a prophet. He is prophet, priest, and king. He is the Messiah. He's the only one. And that's how they got around the curse on Jeconiah. That's how, that is how they got around uh, the fact that... Um, uh, that he would be a priest and a king. Just as prophesied. See, the prophecies seem impossible from this side of it. But once they're fulfilled, you're like, oh. Yeah. 
It seems crazy and doesn't make sense from this side. But once it's fulfilled, it makes perfect sense. And that's the way prophecy is. Prophecy is unveiled until it's fulfilled. It gives you a general idea. It gives you a concept. But it doesn't explain the minutia. That's why how it would play out isn't exactly clear. Because God doesn't show his cards to Satan. He gives us a little idea. Got this covered. But he doesn't show his cards fully. And that's why when you read the book of Revelation, some of you go, I can see how that happened. In other parts of Revelation, you're like, I don't know what that means. Well, that's because until it's fulfilled, it's made. You don't fully understand. He just gives you the idea, hey, we win. And in each scenario, the devil tries to do something. In each scenario, God and his people win. And the point of Revelation to encourage us is, no matter what happens, we win. If you read Revelation and you go away scared, you miss the point. Completely. <clears throat> and so, the fulfillment of all things. Now, the devil, like I said, we're going to sit back and let that go, right? That's not the devil's stock. <laughs> he, he is spiteful. And so he tries to stop it. Now, the ten northern tribes were either killed by the Assyrians or they intermarried with the Assyrians. And so they were a bunch of uh, people who weren't worshiping God. They were worshiping on other mountains and worshiping other gods. Mm -hmm. They were half Jewish or part Jewish, but not fully Jewish. But the real problem with them is not that they weren't fully Jewish, but they, they didn't worship God. They worshiped false God, but they claimed to God. And so when the Jews come back, they don't want to rebuild. The Samaritans, these half Jewish people, they don't want Israel being established. They fought Nehemiah up to, to the nail to stop him from rebuilding the wall. And they try to do the same thing with the temple. Only this time they take a different approach. Instead of acting like enemies at first to intimidate them, they act like friends that want to help them. And I want you to be wary. When you try to do God's work, sometimes people who don't believe the same as you will try to come along and say, hey, let me help you do that. Hey, we're on the same team. Oh, I know we have some differences, but we both worship the same God. We both believe in the same Jesus. No. No, you don't. Jesus warned us that there would be many who say, Lord, Lord. But they don't do what he says. We're, we're told to watch out for wolves in what? Sheep's clothing. That's who these guys were. The enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building the temple of the Lord throughout Israel. They came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build because like you, uh, we see God and have been sacrificing here since the time of, uh, who knows what that guy's name, king of Assyria who brought us here. Oh yeah, we, we worship God, just let us help, let us help you, right? Let us, let us be a part of this. They didn't want to help. They wanted to hinder. They didn't have a sincere desire to help. This was a ruse. But old Zeruba, now the old Zeruba, and Joshua and the rest of the heads of the family said, you have no part with us in building our temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then people around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid of going on building. And they did. But they did discourage them and make them afraid, and it slowed the work. It added 20 more years to the process of rebuilding the It's kind of like um, when the Israelites were coming into the promised land. Uh, you know, they tried to pronounce a curse on it and it didn't work. It just came out as a blessing. And the only way they could slow the Israelites down was to get the Israelites to sin. And the devil can't stop us from succeeding when it comes to building the church. He, the gates of hell just won't prevail. But what can stop the building of the church in the kingdom is fear and discouragement among the people. It's kind of like um, FDR said. 
The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. What holds back the church isn't evil people are going to stop. Uh, wicked people in high places aren't going to keep us from building the church. Do I think persecution and hardships are coming in America? Yeah. But it's not because we're building the church. It's because we're not. If, if God's church would decide we're going to build, there's no stopping. And the devil uses fear and distraction and delay but there's no stopping the inevitable. The inevitable thing is that God's promises will all come to pass. And what held up the rebuilding of the temple wasn't the Samaritans defeating them in battle or the king of Persia turning against them, which was what they tried to get them to be afraid of. But it was their own fear and discouragement. Um, in fact, at one time, the governor of Syria attempted to prevent the reconstruction of the temple. He threatened not to pay tribute to Persia. Look, I'm going to get, I'm going to get the king mad at you. I'm going to not pay my taxes. And when the king asks why, I'm going to say it's because you guys are building this temple. I'm going to get the king mad at you because I'm going to hurt the king where it hurts. Right in the Bible. Oh, he's going to be mad at you. And they're like, whatever. <laughs> And they kept building. And so, he, uh, however, Darius told them to leave the Jews alone. They stopped paying. And so Darius sends them a letter. Uh, leave them alone. And in fact, I want you to pay your tribute, not to me. You're right. You're not going to pay tribute to me. You're going to pay your taxes directly to the Jews. <laughs> oh, man. I love it. This is like one of those Mordecai... Payment moments. <laughs> pay your tribute directly to the work of rebuilding the temple. So not only did they pay the tribute, they had to pay it directly to the people they were trying to stop. And this they did promptly to avoid war. All the powers of hell could not prevent the rebuilding of the temple of the city. Only the neglect of the people of God could hinder his work. Neither war nor threats or insurrection or compromise could stop the work of God. The temple was finally dedicated and there was great cause for rejoicing. Satan had postponed it for 20 years. But he could not prevent it permanently. He could delay it. But he could not deter it forever. You might be part of a church and might say, boy, we, we, things have been really hard. Well, things have, we've taken a step backwards. We've taken a step backwards. And the devil may have used somebody to delay some stuff. But it's going to happen. You said, well, I wanted to accomplish this, and we haven't accomplished it. That's all right, David. If you didn't get it accomplished, just get all the materials and stuff there, you're kidding. It'll get done. The temple of the Lord is going to be built. The church is going to advance. God's people are going to overcome. The only thing that can stop us is if we stop believing we stop trusting and stop working. Just don't stop working. If you just keep working and keep trusting and keep believing, it's going to get done. Whether by many or by a few, God wins. That's just how it is. You can choose to be a part of it, or you can choose to fight against it and be impaled by it. But it's going to happen. You can be on the winning side, or you can be on the losing side, but you can't change who wins and who loses. God wins. And his people win. You know why? Because when you're rebuilding God's temple, he's with you. You build his house, and he'll build your house. Zerubbabel got convicted by Haggai. And he had the same intention of his father David. I shouldn't be living in this fine paneled house. Well, God's temple isn't built. And you know what God gave the rule? The same blessing He gave David. You built my house. So I'm going to build your house, the rule. Messiah is coming through you. And He did. 
and a descendant of Zerubbabel, sits enthroned at the right hand of the Ancient of Days. You build God's house. He'll build your house. You see, well, Kindle, I've got to pay for my kids. I've got to work my job. I've got to take care of my family. I've got to provide for my family. I want good for my family. You want good for your kids, your grandkids, and your those who come after you? Then you focus on building God's house. My daddy put God first all his life and built the kingdom of God. And he has five kids in the Lord that are all faithful to this day. And he didn't hurt us any. The best dad I know. You don't got to neglect your kids to build God's house. In fact, if you try to build your house, you will neglect your kids. And you'll hurt your kids. Build God's temple. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So Ezra prays a prayer. Um, they get the temple built. By the way, when the temple was dedicated, there was just great rejoicing. Woo! And they were singing. And the Bible says they were very happy. When you sacrifice and do God's will and put God's key in first, that's when you're happy. Happiness doesn't come from cars or homes or houses or jobs or earthly wealth or earthly things. Happiness comes from aligning yourselves with the purpose for which you were created. And when you align yourself with God's will, happiness is a byproduct. If you try to do things to be happy, you won't be happy. The more you chase happiness, the more it will slip through your fingers. But if you will not chase happiness, but rather chase holiness, happiness is the byproduct. Happiness and joy are the byproduct of doing God's will. Jesus said, not, not blessed or happy are those who hear them, but happy are those who do what Jesus taught. You want to be happy? Well, they do. They do be happy. Even when Everything goes to hell in the handbasket around you, you'll have joy. You can lose your dad and still have joy. Because of the hope of Christ. You can lose your, your, your spouse and still find joy. You can lose your health. You can lose your life and die smiling because you have the hope of the Lord. When you do God's work, you build God's house. There's joy for you and your children. You want a happy life? And, you know, people say, happy wife, happy life. No. Happy life comes from serving God. You show me somebody who puts the church first in their family's life, and the church is at the center of their family life, and they're serving God wholeheartedly, I'll show you a happy life. And if they turn away from that, I'll show you the most miserable family on the face of the earth. Most miserable people I know are people who turn away from the faith. I don't know anybody more miserable. And they went off chasing happiness in sin, but they don't find it. Happiness comes from this. Now, the people... They do this in the great comfort. So the devil pulls out this, one of the oldest tricks in the book that he's been using all along. He starts to get them to intermarry with the smoking hot pagan living around. There's some beautiful women that are heathen. Now they're half Jew. They're Samaritans. And you can say, well, I mean, they're partly Jewish. Or, you know, hey, he's, you know, we, maybe we'll convert them after we marry <laughs> Look, God said not to marry these foreign women. Not because they're foreign, but because they don't have any faith. And God had commanded them. And all along, there was one part of the law of Moses they never, made, they never obeyed. They swore to obey the law of Moses, and then they promptly did something else. They never kept that. And Solomon, when he was king, he married all those women. And those weren't because he was lusting after all those women. It was because he was making political alliances with his enemies. 
And so he married all those foreign women. They led him astray. They got him to build temples to pagan goddesses. They raised his children. That's what sent them down, split and divided the kingdom. And, and then all these kings afterwards marry these foreign women. Remember, a king married his wife, his son off to uh, the daughter of Jezebel, and how bad that turned out, almost got them all killed. Again and again, though, one of the big problems is they married outside the faith. And so Ezra sees it starting to happen again. They finish the temple. Woo! Rejoice, we got the temple bell. Yeah! And then they start marrying all these foreign women. And Ezra's like, oh no. Oh no, here we go again. And Ezra gets up and prays his prayer. Ezra 10, verse 2, verses follow. And Ezra's agony and prayer gathered around him Shechaniah, who suggested they divorce their unbelieving wife. So Shechaniah hears Ezra's prayer and he goes, Oh man, we're in trouble. And he was with him. And he says, We got to get rid of these pagan women. We can't keep marrying them. We can get rid of the ones we got. And the people of Israel swore to do so. The, Ezra, the, the elders demanded that every man of Jerusalem. Come to Jerusalem or forfeit their inheritance and be removed from the congregation. He says, okay, family meeting. All men of Israel are come to Jerusalem. You don't show up at the meeting. We strike out your inheritance and your family ancestry land goes to somebody else. We're writing you out of Israel. So everybody shows up. And they all showed up. And the rulers demanded the men, make confession to the Lord your God and your fathers and do not and do his pleasure, and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Stop intermingling with these pagans. We've got to stop. Divorce the women you have that you were with, get rid of them, and no more marrying unbelievers. Period. And the men said, okay. And so they sent away their foreign wives. Ezra 10, 11. Now, therefore, make confession to the Lord your God and your fathers, and do this pleasure. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange ones. And we should not marry outside the faith. We should not be married people who are not Christians. My brother Todd was dating a girl in high school. And uh, my sister Laurel was dating a guy who was not a Christian. And dad said to my brother Todd, well, I told Laurel I'm not going to go to her wedding if she marries that guy. Because it's a sin and I'm not going to go celebrate a sin. I'm not going to be a part of it. If she marries him, then I'll help her to be if you like as best I can and get her to keep her vows. But it's wrong for her to marry him and I'm not going to be a part of it. That's what I told her. What do you think of that, Todd? My brother Todd says, well, Dad, I think you're right. You did the right thing. It's tough, you know, but I think you did right. And he says, okay, well, you we understand, I'm not going to your wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and Todd says, what do you mean? She, she's baptized. She goes to church every week. He said, Todd being dipped in water and going to church doesn't make you a Christian. And he read to him from Galatians, and he read the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And he said, which one describes your girlfriend? Todd said, well, I guess the works of the flesh. He said, yeah, she doesn't have any evidence of the Spirit in her life. She's just going to church because she wants to be with you. And she's not a believer or a follower of Jesus, even though she's dipped in water. And I won't be a part of your wedding. And to Todd's credit, he broke it off. And I'm sure he has thanked God a thousand times that he did. Because he, not long after that, his wife now, Jennifer, who is the most wonderful Christian wife you've ever met. And my dad really believed that Christians should not marry outside of faith. And he was serious about it. And until we have that level of seriousness, we aren't going to keep generations from going astray. What led generations of Israelites away from God into paganism was who they married. And, now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that a Christian who's married to a non-Christian should divorce them. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you're married to a non-Christian and they're willing to live with you, you should be faithful to them and keep your vows and stay with them. I'm not saying divorce your, but if they want to leave, it says, and they want to divorce you, it says to let them go and you're free to remarry. So if they want to leave you, you're free to remarry and 
let them have the divorce. You know, there's some people, I've known people where, um, you know, the one of them becomes a Christian, the other one still wants to party, and they don't want to be with them anymore. You know, it's you know, kind of like that old that old blues song that they used to sing, if you don't start drinking, I'm going to leave, you know. And if you don't go back to partying with me, I'm out of here. And that happens. And uh, I know people right now that they're married to an unbeliever and they want to leave. If, if the Bible says if they do, let them go. And you're free to move on with your life. God wants you to have peace and have a, have a happy marriage. And Paul encouraged people, uh, except during that one time of persecution, he talks about first Corinthians, but he encouraged uh, young women to marry, have children, have, you know. But he says, but marry in the Lord. And he told us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. A yoke, in the Old Testament, you weren't allowed to put a cow and a horse together. Because they wouldn't work together, and they'd pull apart, and they'd break the yoke, and, they, and they'd ruin the, the field. So he said, never have your animals on equal yoke. That was an analogy. Was it just about oxen that God cared? No, he was talking about us spiritually. We shouldn't be on equal yoke with others who aren't going in the same direction. And how can you get in a bond or yoke with an unbeliever? Now, we often quote that, do not be unequally yoked um, in reference to marriage, and certainly it applies to that, but it's not just talking about marriage. It's talking about business, too. It's talking about other ways you can be yoked to somebody. And don't be yoked with unbelievers. A lot of churches don't want to do some sort of ecumenical thing where we get all the churches together of all these different strikes and do something. Now, be careful with that. Because what, what are you going to do when they get up and start preaching false doctrine, and now you're supporting it and part of it? Don't, there, there's no point in yoking yourself together with churches that don't teach the truth on the, on the essential doctrines of the faith. Don't, you don't need to have some community service with, the, with the, you know, all these other weird denominations and all this good, you know, don't band together and yoke yourself to unbelievers. And before you go into business and a business partner, before you think about, you think real hard about who you bind yourself to. I mean, a lot of guys go into business with a non-Christian and then that guy turns out to be a scoundrel and they end up destroying their reputation. Be careful uh, who you're yoked to. We don't, and so Ezra's prayer was answered. All, the, all of these now join their fellow Israelites and nobles and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and obey carefully all the commands and regulations and decrees of the Lord. We promise not to give ourselves or not to give our daughters in marriage to the people around us, nor take their daughters for our sons. They promised to go all, all these little things in the law that they never really kept, they promised to do. Now we're going to keep the Sabbath years. Now we're going to, now we're going to uh, you know, all these little things that turn out to be big doors that swing on small hands. And marry in the faith. And that's what they commit to do. And let me tell you what. Israel had its problems after this. Judah had its problems after this. But you know what never happened again? Never again after this, after they make that one change, never again did the Jewish people become idolatrous. That one thing. Um, uh, let's see what time I got. Well, I'm already over, so I'm going to uh, So, big door swing on small hinges. I was going to tell a personal story, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm already way over. A few, a few returned to Jerusalem to build the walls, thanks to Nehemiah. A big door swung in the small hand. Almost 50,000 returned to build the temple, thanks to Zerubbabel and Cyrus. A big door swung in the small hand. Israelites were rebuked and procrastinated and built their own homes instead of rebuilding the temple. But they stopped, thanks to Haggai, because a big door swung in the small hand. The children of Israel were encouraged to rebuild the temple because of the coming Nazarene, thanks to the prophet Zechariah. He gave them that second boot step as Rubable to get it finished. A big door, so on a small hand. The Jews divorced their strange wives and started obeying the Sabbath and supporting the temple and the priesthood, thanks to Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi, because big doors swing on small hinges. And if this period of the rebuilding and the restoration can teach us anything, it's that one man or one woman like Esther can make all the difference. And right now, we often refer to the restoring of the church to the New Testament pattern as a restoration movement. 
We're supposedly in a time of restoration. And that started in earnest in the 19th century. But due to the devil's fear and discouragement, that is slow. And now we need a Zechariah. We need someone who will stand up and say, let's finish the work. Let's restore the Lord's church. You say, well, how can we do that? Everything's so bad. Big doors. And swing those small hinges. I hope that you will be used by God. And you will have the faith to accomplish something great for Him. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together tonight. I pray that we would be faithful. Faithful hinges on which big things swing. I pray, God, that you would work on me, change my heart, grow me, forgive me, and strengthen me, that I might be fruitful for you. And the second half of my existence might be more fruitful than the first. I pray that you would teach me faithfulness, that you would give me integrity, that you would help me to, to follow after you and trust. Help me to follow the words I've spoken tonight that are easy to say, but sometimes hard to do. I pray that you would embolden us and that we might, when we hear the words of a Haggai, have the integrity and the repentance of Zerubbabel. And I pray you put and stir up in our heart, like you did Zerubbabel and Joshua, that passion to build your temple, the church. Stir it up in our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask knowing you will. Amen.